to CITE Career Connect with Kate. My name is Kate Whitfield and I'm a principal with Alta Planning and Design in Ottawa. The goal of each and every episode is to help people looking for jobs in Canada in the field of transportation engineering and planning. In this episode, we talk about um, private and public sector, maybe moving between the two, but also as usual about networking and trying to help people uh, find a job. So with that, we'll dive into the conversation with our guests. So as you know, we each have two minutes to sort of introduce yourself and a topic of interest in our field. I'll introduce each speaker as we go back and forth and then get a discussion going. The usual format is three currently employed people in our field and three job seekers, but uh, our two job seekers turned into people already employed. So congratulations, that's awesome. And now you're going to share some stories on how you got your jobs and sort of the more tips too on the early stages of, of employment. But that's really awesome because this is about networking and helping others. So normally I start with someone uh, currently employed in our field, but instead I'm going to start with you, Romaine, because uh, I don't know, first off, you're a New Brunswick grad, which is my alma mater. So already a soft spot for you studying uh, UNB in Fredericton. So you have a master's in civil engineering, uh, but as far as I understand, uh, starting out with a job in Ottawa. So uh, currently in Vancouver, University in Fredericton, but coming from, if I have it right, Kingston, Jamaica. So I love it, right? From there to New Brunswick, to Vancouver, to Ottawa, and starting a job with EXP. So I'll pass it over to you for your, for your two minutes to say hello. Hi Kate. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, that that is right. I've I've kind of been a little bit all over the world, but you know, looking forward to getting to Ottawa and settling and and, and um, you know, start out in transportation there. Um, as you said, I I am a UNB uh, University of New Brunswick grad. Um, I spent two years there um, doing my MSc and specializing in transportation planning. Um, my my favorite project i think uh from there was 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 um i i worked on an agent-based model to sort of um explore the intricacies of car-based volunteer driver program planning which are pretty popular um alternative modes of transportation for new brunswick um given the the rural sort of context that that transportation has there and i really liked it because it it sort of um was it had a lot of elements uh, a lot of multidisciplinary elements there was transportation planning software programming and a lot of operations um what i'm looking forward to most in in, in transportation and, and and working in the field i'd say um is just sort of the the depth that it has you know you can work on projects that impact transit you can work on projects um, that impact highways and you can work on active transportation um, corridors, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say at this point that there is anything that I absolutely love or that is my favorite. I'm just looking forward to getting involved with anything that I can. Um, thank you, Kate. Oh, that's great and that's exciting. Uh, and then I'll also look forward to getting to meet you maybe in person here in Ottawa when you make your way to the city. So our next guest is Heather. So Heather's a transportation engineer. And I, I, I use the title here because I think it's part of the learning. Associate Vice President of Highways and Market, or Road Market Sector Lead at HDR. So titles aren't everything, but they're part of learning in networking because that's maybe how an, a company like HDR also sort of breaks up its groups and thinks about its leadership within its groups. So I think there's something interesting in there too for, for people to learn about Heather. Um, and I've been enjoying getting to know you over the last little while. And I want to hear also when we get into the discussion about uh, both pu public and private sector jobs. But Heather, I'll pass it over to you for your introduction. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, one of the, the really fun things about my role today at HCR, and it touches on something Romaine mentioned, is I feel like I get to work across the true reach of our highways and roads services at HDR. Um, so my role is really focused on um, on business development, client relationships, and strategy, but it goes across our service offerings of traffic engineering, planning, road design, 
bridges, hydraulics, and contracted men. And for me, this is personally interesting because I feel like I've bounced around a little bit in my career. And and one project that you know that really stood out to me um, a number of years back in my career that I worked on, uh, which is currently in construction, um, so really stands out as a point of interest, was for the Ontario Ministry of Transportation. It's on the QEW. It's the Credit River Bridge. I had the opportunity to manage the environmental assessment and the preliminary design study, um, but it's really incredible. To me, that job was completed in 2014, and I'm now getting to watch the construction happen. Um, one of the reasons I enjoyed this project so much is I got to work across bridge engineering, highway engineering, public engagement, mitigating environmental impacts, um, thinking of innovative solutions to you know, fix the, the bridge issues and long-term maintenance of that existing bridge, which is designated a provincially uh, significant heritage structure. If anybody's had the opportunity to go down in the valley. And in parallel, we actually, I worked really closely with the city of Mississauga on that project in helping the city work with the ministry and achieving some new active transportation crossings across the river. So um, those were pretty groundbreaking at that time. And we found many ways to integrate bike lanes, improve bike crossings, um, and, and, and just improve features for the community as well. So I always enjoy when we get to do a bit of engineering and also improve people's communities in the process. That's great. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there too. Uh, Bob, yeah, we're going to go to you next. Uh, Transportation EIT at, at Jacobs in Burnaby. So we met through LinkedIn, uh, started talking a while ago about getting you on the episode, but then you went and got a job there at, at Jacobs, which is really wonderful. So a Master's of Civil and Environmental Engineering at University of Alberta as your background. But when we were prepping for the episode, wow, we had such a great chat. You have so many tips to share, and I love that you're just one. I could have you as the only guest. I love it that you're here and you want to help others. So just as that is your introduction, I'll pass it over to you to say hello. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Kate. Hello, everyone. This is Bhavya. Uh, I've been working with Jacobs for the past three months as a transportation EIT. Like Kate said, I'm a graduate of U of A, and uh, it's been a great journey so far with Jacobs and uh, I I loved connecting with a lot of people. The best part was connecting. It's a Buy America uh, uh, market uh, as far as Jacobs is concerned. I got a chance to interact with a lot of professionals uh, from the US as well as Canada. So it's it's been going great. And uh, particularly why I choose transportation engineering is because of a project uh, in my masters it's 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 with traffic safety we got a opportunity to work with city of edmonton so halfway through the project we understood that it was a lrt expansion project construction site and normal guidelines wouldn't apply to it and our our, our site itself it stood out from the rest of the class and we had to come up with a very innovative uh, approach to uh, to tell us what our safety measures for the site would be and the best part was we we took it challenging we did everything and after that the city of edmonton when we gave them the presentation they loved it it was so economical the basic steps but they they reduced the collisions to almost like 50 percent at that intersection so at that point it really inspired me to become a transportation engineering professional and I'm looking forward to work with a lot of great uh, projects in BC. Thank you, Kate. That's great. And I love uh, hearing about that sort of experience bringing you forward. So finally, John. John is a professional planner, uh, manager of transportation planning at Parsons out of the Markham office. I bring this up for a bunch of things too. Right, how a company might divide up its groups and think about leadership within departments, but also CITE is about planners as well as engineers, too. So I love that we have uh, uh, Heather as a transportation engineer and John as a transportation planner. Um, I think we met when you were in private sector and then spoke again when you were with this with Ajax. You can talk about your career moves through that, John. Um, yeah. Now that you're back in the private sector, so <clears throat> an obvious choice for a theme today about moving yeah. between sectors. But if John, if you could uh, introduce yourself, that would be great. 
Yeah, no, thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, as you said, I've I've kind of um, gone between sectors throughout my career. Uh, I am a transportation planner. I have a, a planning background, and and that is what I've enjoyed doing, really throughout my career. So, <clears throat> excuse me, starting in in the private sector, uh, I did a numerous uh, transportation master plans, uh, really focused on that all across the GTA. Into the pro into the public sector, I was able to then focus in on on one municipality, one town, uh, which was a whole new experience. Um, and then just recently, only three months ago, I've come back to the private sector. And really uh, what brought me back, it, it, I guess ties to my, my most favorite project and, and really my most favorite work is transportation master plans. I, I, I love creating those long, uh, you know, long or forward thinking, long-term visions uh, for cities and municipalities. And my most recent one, when I was at uh, the town of Ajax, we did our uh, integrated transportation master plan. It was the third iteration of the transportation master plan, the second iteration of the active transportation master plan, and the conscious approach was taken to combine them. Instead of treating them as separate plans, um, we moved them so that they were brought together, so that you looked at the networks in parallel or in conjunction with each other, ensuring uh, you had complete streets, um, that you had that connectivity uh, primarily for the active user first. And really what was an exciting um, approach or, or method we used was in our public consultation, we ended up taking all of those comments and, and putting a geospatial reference to them. And then we were able to create heat maps. And it was unbelievable to see the correlation of strengths and weaknesses areas of improvement and, and, and areas that the, you know, the public loved show up on these heat maps. And we actually discovered a few areas uh, that people never thought of as a strength or a weakness, but they showed up in the mapping and we were able to address them or celebrate them for their successes. And so moving now into the private sector, part of my role here at Parsons is I'm, grow, uh, I'm attempting to grow our uh, transportation planning presence in the industry. Parsons, uh, particularly the GTA, is known for tra traffic engineering or transportation engineering. We have some great uh, professionals in, you know, modeling space. Uh, but I bring over my my experience in transportation planning and and hope to uh, see us with you know my my colleagues move into that industry and and provide the next municipality that that great plan that uh, set them off on their journey to have the traffic engineers take over and design the roads and build them. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I, I have so many questions going in my head there, John, just also about being in a municipal office where the counselor might come down the hall or uh, maybe a you know city manager versus being in a maybe a private sector office where uh, politics and uh, other things that push a city are obviously in our lives, uh, but in a different way, right? When you pick up the phone and it's not necessarily, I pay your taxes or, um, right, this is my community. It's sort of a different in daily interaction maybe. Oh, uh, I, absolutely. It, yeah. it's, um, it, it was a stark reality. I, I, I think everyone's heard the, the expression that, you know, municipal sector is the easier profession and, um, I don't, no. Well, I've heard it before, and and you know what? I may have been guilty of it before, thinking, "Hey, this is going to be simpler, or it's going to be I'll be able to focus myself on on one community." And I did, but the layers that exist in that community are far more than you can ever imagine. It is the, you know, the politicians who have have a, a pet project or a a desire. It's the residents calling you. And so, yes, you're focused on one community, but you're focused, especially in my case, on every single element of that community. Whereas, you know, in the private sector often, or, you know, if you're lucky, you get to focus in on one type of work and you may be doing that for multiple municipalities, but it's only that one type of work or that 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 spectrum is a little less broad. And in, in, in municipal work, you're often, you're everything and and you have to, to manage all of that so it was it was eye-opening for me i enjoyed it uh, i do miss it but i also enjoy uh being back in the private sector as well 
Yeah, and I, I joke with my hands up on saying that because uh, some people, that comes up a lot, right, of, over uh, private sector versus public, but I think there's so many more layers to it too, right, on type of jobs uh, and also what you're driven by. Um, so we can get into that, but I don't want to, I could talk about that for a long time, so I want to see what else, what other kind of conversation I can get going. Um, so when we think about private and public, we think about what jobs people apply for, right? Um, Bavia, do you, do you have any questions sort of related to that uh, when it comes to sort of private sector, public sector experiences or any observations from your own job hunting that you want to share? If I can pass it over. Yeah. Public and private sector, yeah. Uh, about the job search experience, it's been different really. Uh, the public sector, like uh, it was standard. I mean, I didn't uh, quite get the responses as expected from both parties. But uh, the public sector, it was more straightforward and like there was a path set forward for like uh, I apply, I get a response, maybe an uh, interview scheduled and they get back to me. But the private sector, it's been like, uh, it's not straightforward. I mean, if they want, they'll just hire you. Otherwise, you just have to reach out to somebody or reach out to the HR, show your genuine interest and then uh, maybe ask who is hiring for the role or reach out to the PM. Then uh, if they're impressed by your profile or your interest, it goes forward. So that's 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 what my experience as for uh, the public and private sector from the job search uh, perspective, uh, and here to explore from the technicality, uh, I haven't gotten a chance much to explore uh, the technical side yet, but hopefully. Yeah, but you make a great point there. So, um, it, and also it's really fun to hear what it's like for you because. You know, as someone that hears about public sector jobs, there's, it's much more scripted and sort of steps. Uh, but both prepping for this, both Bavia and Romain said that it actually seemed longer in the private sector than in the public, where I always thought it was the other way around, that in the public you could get a call back a year to two years later. Uh, in private, uh, we might, I, in my experience, we have a lot more flexibility, so I don't have to follow exact screening and exact steps. I can say, hey, you applied, sounds great, can we have a screening call? And I can almost ask you anything I want, essentially, within reason, anything I want. And it's much, it can be more casual. Uh, so, but I get, I want to dig into some of the stuff you just said there, Bavia, because you also, you, you implied that private requires a little more networking to know who to talk to to get noticed because of the lack of structure. I think you said that in there. So, Romain, you're nodding. Uh, do you want to add into this? I, I just absolutely agree with everything Bobby has said. Um, I, I, while I was, was job hunting, I, I did also notice. So one of the things I did, I created a, a spreadsheet with, with pretty much every job, every location. Um, and, and so I had like a good idea of what was like a city job versus um, a private sector job. And I noticed maybe a couple of months in that a lot of the lead times for um, public sector jobs were standard like three months. So from my date of initial application to when I get maybe a rejection or, or some sort of decision, it would have been maybe a solid 90 days. Um, whereas private sector, Oftentimes, as Bavia said, you will know in a day, you'll know in a week, you'll know in two weeks. It's it's usually very immediate. So that that's just one of the things I, I picked up on. And and federal jobs too are, are probably even longer than 90 days. Um, I think there there might have still been one that I am currently still in lead time for. Uh, I don't know. It's been like six months, but we'll see. I figure the two of you have good advice for some HR departments and some companies on what it's like on your side uh, for this process. Uh, Romaine, I love that you have a spreadsheet and you had an idea of sort of who responded. How did people respond to, right? Like telling you where someone was at in the process, uh, even knowing that they moved on to someone else too, right, would be part of it. Um, do you have a quick story just on getting your job in terms of something you learned from? 
like any chance you can tell us what you think got you your exp job in ottawa are you willing to try absolutely so uh as, as bobby has said again to um private sector getting into private sector jobs can be heavily network uh, dependent um i think i think that is something that sort of worked in my interest so um someone in my network um reached out to me and said hey i know someone who is hiring um potentially and you know they're looking for like a great candidate to join you know that office and upstart um and you know i think you know you could be the guy you know reach out to them and see and just with sort of the freedom that private sector hiring has um that can that's allowed to happen whereas i think um public sector um you have to have um like a, an advertised sort of competition open for a set amount of time you know even if you have a candidate in mind and i think sometimes too you know there will be candidates in mind and persons in the lead in public sector or internal hire sort of thing but um you know on the outside you'd see it on linkedin in a posting and not sort of know that but then just sort of go through the formality of you know going into the pool doing the interview but not really having a chance um so i think all in all um my exp sort of um, thing was sort of more networking dependent and more sort of about the fit um versus uh public sector where where uh, things are a little different I'm also going to share because Steve's camera's off, but he needs to hear this. You told me that you and your roommate would watch the episodes, and that gave you some tips. So to anyone who needs to go back to some of the early ones that you said it did help you out, just on, on this game of how to contact people, how to build that network, how to sort of get that going. I know that's a little pat on the back with the story, but I just I, that was really cool to picture you and your roommate in New Brunswick thinking, okay, let's watch these episodes and see what we, maybe we can increase our chances, right? Absolutely. That was actually an email that went out from um, our department. Um, Eric, Eric, he, he sent out an email and he said, um, by the way, like check out these CIT these seminars, like you guys are gonna be looking for jobs um, soon. And, you know, it's a pretty good thing to watch. And yeah, we, we started watching them and kind of got into you know, how to go about our job search and stuff. That's awesome. And what's also awesome is Eric Hildebrand was a prof when I was there and his prof when Romain was there. So I think that's pretty awesome. So Heather, you did yeah. Ontario Ministry of Transportation first, right? And then private? Do you want to take it that any way you want with the, what you want to share with the group, like observations between the two work environments or getting a getting that job in the first place? Uh, do you have any advice yeah. to share or comments? Well, I actually had a little a little taste of what the private sector was as a student because um, I did complete 12 months of co-op experience. So I had worked in Vancouver for a, a bridge consulting firm for eight months, and then I spent summer working for a construction company in Halifax. And then after graduation, I I spent about five months applying to a whole range of jobs, public sector, private sector, in a number of different provinces, and was really excited to land the role with, with the Ontario Ministry of Transportation and their engineering development program. And it's really interesting. I'm really enjoying like hearing Bobby and Romain's experiences today, because it, it takes me back to that process that I went through at that time. And and really now I feel like it was somewhat lucky that I landed the role at MTO when I think about how little I actually understood their hiring process um, until, until after I joined. And then after I joined um, to move up through the organization, you have to go through the same application and interview process again. So you start to learn, once you're an employee, you learn really deeply like what they look for in cover letters and what they look for in your resume and how to tailor it and, and how they screen. And, and so I, I started to sort of take that information and then share it with my network um, when I was still working there. And I think it even applies, it probably still applies, you know, to jobs potentially with municipalities or Metrolinx today as well. It is a very different process, a very rigorous process um, that they take you through. And I think for candidates to be able to understand that 
um, I think also benefits the employers as well because they could potentially be missing out on some really phenomenal candidates who just maybe didn't have the right sentences or words dropped into their, their resume. Um, but yeah, and then it is it is quite interesting. Even just recently, I, I changed roles and had an opportunity to interview with both public and private sectors again. Um, and it is interesting, just the contrast um, between the two age like groups. And it is still very even at this stage in my career. You know, private sector roles were people that I connected through often with my network. The interviews were very informal and casual. Um, but I also found myself having to be just as thoughtful or sometimes even more mindful about um, wanting to convey my experience. Um, when you're in a casual conversation, it can sort of be easy to lose um, lose sight. Like you could easily talk to somebody for an hour and not really learn a lot about the role if I wasn't mindful of asking the right questions. So I think certainly for anybody that's in a job search today, um, something to think, you know, think really carefully about the kind of questions you want to ask. What do you want to know about this role um, when you're going through that process so that you don't find yourself just chit-chatting for an hour with the uh, potential employer. Um, and and even at my stage in the career, I found, you know, applying for some uh, public public sector jobs can be very challenging. There's a lot of, a lot of candidates and a lot of competition out there today. Um, and a lot of people with very interesting experience. So networking, even for those jobs, um, I have heard from other colleagues and, and coworkers can prove to be very helpful as well, because it give you a better understanding of, of what, um, what they have in mind for those roles that they're hiring for. Yeah, so that's about building your network with not always with the intention that that person gets me this job, but it can be now, it can be years from now. And then that other part about just networking to understand what the jobs are like and what people are looking for. So when you call the manager of planning, transportation planning at Parsons, you get a sense of the role of TMPs, for instance, how to get John's attention, right? It's TMP. So John, uh, you were at Ajax. Do you want to tell any stories of hiring within a municipality? Because I can only give the private sector perspective. Do you have a anything about the process inside cities sure uh and, and <clears throat> excuse me i think i think it's exactly as as we've all kind of discussed uh so far it, it can be very rigorous um you know with ajax we had um both an internal process and an external process so a job posting uh would start with internal candidates and you'd look at are there any qualified individuals currently employed with the t with the town uh, so you go through that process and then uh, you would then look external. Um, again, set period of time. Then uh, obviously there's a review of candidate period, uh, depending on what job you're applying for. Um, I had between, I think my lowest was, you know, under 10 applying to a certain position. My, my largest application pool was greater than 60. And so you know, you got to find your time to review those applications. Um, so it, it can be timely just to get to your list of candidates. Um, internally, we then had a process that interviews were set up, but they had to be with both HR and the hiring manager. So now you're coordinating schedules and, uh, you know, HR is helping multiple um, departments across town. There's only a few of them. There's only so much time in a day. Um, so then sometimes interviews aren't for a couple of weeks. Uh, you do your interviews. Sometimes we brought people in for second, even third interviews, depending on the seniority of the position. So it is a, it is a time consuming process. I absolutely uh, understand that that's what it looks like from, from the outside. And I'll tell you, that's what it was from the inside. There's a lot more process. There's a lot more structure. Um, and it only gets... I would say more process driven and, and a higher structure, the more senior, you know, the higher in the seniority ladder you go, because you can get into places where you need, you know, departmental approvals and all of that. So, um, yeah, unfortunately it can be a little slow, but, but it's there for, it's there for a purpose. It, I, I think it, 
uh, it ends up with a you end up with your best candidates so from a municipal employee perspective you're happy at the end but it can be slow sometimes yeah and i say this only because I, I heard it from others but uh, in a municipal interview sometimes you can show no re i think you have to show no reaction to someone's answer i always react and i'm always smiling so i don't know how you're supposed to sit there and show no appreciation for someone's answer where in you know, private you can be a little more of a of a banter but uh, yeah absolutely and it's much more structured than the questions you asked we had like we had a list of 100 questions we could choose from and you literally picked you said okay i want to ask question 7 and 23 and 14 and 63 like it's predetermined what you're going to ask Amazing. whereas the ca the casual conversation can be um, i th i enjoy those much better because you can learn much more if you're, as Heather said, if you're, if you're coming into it with some pointed questions or some specific questions, and then you get way further than, you know, the typical, tell me what you'd like to do in five years. Yeah, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Yeah. Um, so Bob, when we were prepping, you told me a great story about um, how to get people to respond to you on LinkedIn or how to build a relationship on LinkedIn. Would you mind sharing that? Because I just thought that was so good yeah definitely like uh if i can uh sum up all my experience of my job hunting in one sentence it's like uh it's in one sentence it, it's a one word like send personalized invites it's not like a social media platform where we just uh send send connection requests just not uh that one don't press that one button because you're sending an invite to a person who don't know you at all and who's like very new to you so first thing is see their profile understand what they're doing and send a personalized invite and after that many people asked me like uh, how did you make connections as an international student because we don't know much about the canadian government canadian job market or what kind of uh, jobs the industry does so i would say that's what your two years of graduation is for like if you see a job description go and dig a bit deeper and collect the data like if this is an organization that is giving out this job description probably they have that sort of candidates just do your research and that's how send personalized invites and like most of the like the top uh, question i got after i got placed in jacobs was like uh, how to ask for a reference my advice is don't ask for a different uh, reference upfront like you don't have to ask about the word reference just show your genuine interest ask them about the job and ask them about uh, who is hiring for the role is there someone you can reach out to about the role and when you're actually uh, showing that kind of interest the person who are who you are actually talking to can be triggered and they're like this person is actually showing interest and let me uh, uh, tell them that I can give you a reference. That was my experience. Like when I showed the interest, the person who I was actually talking to, they told like, I really like your enthusiasm. Let me refer you. That's what they did for me. And that can work for you. I mean, you don't have to always ask for a reference or just keep in touch, engage with people. And when you send a personalized invite, keep in touch. If they're sharing something, uh, hit that like button or comment telling this is a great post or something that sort of thing definitely helps and I couldn't agree more about uh, Heather's comment on sending the uh, uh, personalizing and customizing your resume and cover letter according to the job description because one thing uh, that really helped me is uh, customizing my resume according to the keywords that were in the job description that that really worked for me so I advise keep doing that, make more connections, keep in touch, engage and show like uh, interest and ask ask people like what the job is about. Is there someone you can talk to? That really helps and that's what helped me. That's really that's really helpful and, and I, I hear you. It's not a, I did it a few times. Hey Kate, I see there's a job here. Can you refer me to it? And if we've never met, I've never seen your work. No, I'm not going to. That's what you're saying too, right, Bavia? Is like it doesn't work like that. However, you know, if you uh, can find out maybe who the per the hiring manager is and then connect yourself, or uh, it can it can come around that way. So that's really really helpful. And just 
using these episodes to meet people from different companies. So I'm going to put Heather and John on the spot, but I'll talk about something else where you think about your answer. But your HDR in Parsons, come on. So how does someone either get your attention or how do you prefer to be contacted in the networking world? Give a, give a tip. Um, but I, while you think about your answer, uh, Romain, do you want to say anything else about sort of networking, uh, making connections, share something, some advice? I I um I just want to reiterate what Bavia said about putting yourself out there on LinkedIn and not being afraid to to connect and just like observe what's going on in, in someone's network. I, I also um did that a couple of times. It wasn't easy at first because I think I just sometimes um just feel a little bit awkward just sending a note to someone I've never met. Um but I the first time I, I got over it, um it landed me you know, just like an informal interview, like a coffee chat, and then that sort of led to a more permanent interview. And even though that particular opportunity didn't work out, you know, it still got me in the room and it still got me an opportunity that I would have had, you know, had I not done that. Um, so it's going to feel a bit awkward and strange, you know, initially, but um, it really does help. And it, it, it's still um, it's still good to, to put yourself out there and just you know, forget about that feeling of, of awkwardness that you have doing it. Awesome. So Heather, do you want to give a piece of advice? Yeah, I mean, how to, I think Romaine and Bavia, the advice that you've given people is, is spot on. Um, I've had a number of people connect with me on LinkedIn in different ways. And, and definitely a tailored specific question um, as somebody who's potentially, you know, I'm looking to hire candidates all the time, are the most helpful because if somebody simply connects without a question or a comment, you know, you'll often see it and go, oh, they just want to add to their network, okay. And it's, you know, a passing thought throughout the day, but if somebody has a specific question or they want a coffee chat to hear about what is the industry like, because this is a big industry and there's, a lot of diversity of opportunities and it's a lot to learn when you're you're coming new to the job market you know I'm happy to share and many of my colleagues are we frequently pass um, CVs that come to us or resumes or referrals from LinkedIn amongst each other internally the different lead are different leaders different hiring managers we also um, I also enjoy, many of us will get resumes through different professional, young professional groups or connections that people may have met. So to anybody who may, may be still in university, if they have a, a project or an industry project, a senior year project, and there's somebody from industry who is helping volunteer with your group, you know, I'd say don't hesitate to reach out, maybe ask them to hear, learn a little bit more about their company or their job or what they do. Um, because I think, you know, anybody that we meet, um, in the, in the crossing of our education or career, um, is, can often be happy to make those connections. John, do you have anything to add there? Uh, no, uh, well, no, not really. I think everyone has said it. Okay. It's great. Enough. Um, but the only thing I would add is, is, you know, hopefully we're coming back to, uh, to in-person, you know, uh, workshops and conferences and, those are those great opportunities as well. Often you run into someone, you know, that you've never met before and you have introductions and, 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 you know, you end up connecting on LinkedIn afterwards and, and, you know, that, that, that connection, that exposure grows. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about being, being authentic. And I, I say it and it, it, it often sounds, I don't know, crass or something, but be more than just generic you know it's it's easy enough to click join my network it's easy enough to fire off that to whom it may concern i'd like to be hired cv those get lost very quickly you know we see those it's when you ask a specific question when you you know you've done some research about the company before you reach out to someone and, and you want to engage in a conversation about you know a project that you may be working on it's those people who put in that little bit of effort they are remembered. You know, we think about them a, a, a week down the road, a month down the road, you know, when that next, next opportunity comes up and we may reach right back out to you and say, hey, I've got something. Do you want to come in and chat? That's great. So coming back around to the 
public, private, because I, it's part of figuring out jobs and figuring out what people like. I had a great meeting the other day with someone out of city and they said they liked a, a public sector job because they could see the, the project from beginning to end into implementation. So an example might be a transportation master plan. So they get it passed, but then they actually still get to do the projects year one, two, three, four afterwards where maybe a consultant has to come in and get out again because of contractually what they're required to do. So I thought that was one interesting sort of example to give today about maybe the two to two sectors. I always talk about the hustle of consultancy, which other people might not agree exists, but to me, if it's just an element, you've got to win work to have enough work, which winning work means you have to compete. So there's an element of sort of like nice competition side, which I don't know how the equivalent John in the public sector version of that winning budget money for your project over some other project. I'm just kidding, but that sort of like business side of the hustle. And so when I'm looking for someone in private sector, yeah, I'm curious. I don't necessarily want them to tell them me that they're entrepreneurs, but it's still a part of it, which I find interesting when I'm talking to someone and their interest, if they want to be in private or public. Heather, I got a little nod out of you. You want to help me with a, a thought on that, or can you can you give an example? Oh, and the you know chasing the work side of the business is that or, or anything just because we're trying to help people with like do they see themselves in a public role or a private role? Not that you can't move between as evidence through the people here, but just trying to describe it. But I mean, I'm just having fun with that if if that makes any sense to people because also. Um, I mean, uh, people's involvement in that side in an early career is less, typically, but it's still a part of the consulting business is, is getting the work. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that stood out for me in my early career experiences, like working in, in bridge consulting, and I was working you know, in a, in, as a student, I worked for a firm that was in a really highly specialized field, and then moving over to MTO, is many times in consulting, um, there's an element of tech like very high technical expertise so many people within their fields in consulting become highly specialized at one thing there are still generalists like you know john's planner i'm more of a generalist um but still specialized within a field um and so then there's that opportunity to 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 present at conferences to work with committees through CITE or TAC, et cetera. Um, there was still, I could see that technical expertise um, when I moved over to MTO, but it's in a slightly, it's a, there's a different perspective. The technical expertise is focused, they're an owner of the infrastructure. So they're, they're an expert, you know, as John mentioned, of that municipality or of that owner of infrastructure um and, and have to bring a, a different perspective and be involved in all things related to managing and, and running that piece of infrastructure whether it's maintaining the bridge rehabilitating the bridge um you know adding bike lanes etc so um i want to tell one last small story because there's some tips in it too and then see if anyone wants to add to it um Alta right now has a planning internship job up 250 applicants in three weeks so my point of my story has a few tips in it one is the website said write a cover letter and post a resume because you're not supposed to have any experience so it doesn't matter if you had awesome co-ops before it's supposed to be none so if people don't post a cover letter and I'm not evaluating on work experience, then what am I evaluating on? Only where you went to school. So of, of those people, some people were ruled out that were awesome because there's nothing to review, right? If in true theory, it's not, it's just, it doesn't matter just where you went to school. Second is it really, it's emotional how many people are awesome in that pile. So a lot of awesome people are not going to get a job and it does not mean you're not awesome, but wow, through a computer system and there's no algorithm to review these you might you you know so a lot of people so um to get through wasn't you've had five intern internships previously in your 
tough. It's it's just something in that that's personal that shows that you read the company website because we are a company that's pretty visible. You can figure us out pretty easily online. So I just found that really interesting. So with the slog, right, Romain, your spreadsheet, right, and how many rejections, there's an element of there of it's got nothing to do with you, right? That you, you probably had to figure that out too, Romain, in your process, right? It's got nothing to do with you. You could be screened out for the smallest things um, and it might just be down to a few people. Uh, you unmuted there. Do you want to add something on that thought? Uh, absolutely. Um, you, you brought me back to, to sort of a realization that I had um, in terms of when I was applying and getting interviews. I felt like, um, you know, similarly, I got interviews for positions where I had a good sort of inkling that someone was actually reading my cover letter because um, I felt like maybe um, I was maybe able to better connect with them that way and they'd be like okay like this person has like a real interest in transportation but I don't think um, for the most part I was able to like when it's a computerized system I, I at least th that was my theory from from applications um, so yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a good point like how do you narrow down now 250 people like reading it's, it's it's pretty hard yeah or a million applicants and you're putting in the energy of applying to a million of things but not really putting a lot of effort into your application is also a waste of effort too because you're not going to make it through to the top layer if it's just a standard response every time it's exhausting for you right and you won't really make it through and then also if you have a love for it you will find your way to that job right like it does like there's a there's many ways of tackling this and getting into into the work. Um, Bavia, do you have something to add there? Yeah, sure. Like you said, uh, my my suggestion is always quality over quantity. Don't don't uh, put a target like you have to apply for this many jobs in this week and you have to send out this many applications because uh, lately like if some people are reaching out to me I, i've got a chance to because many people help me uh, to review my resume and it is my opportunity to give back so when i'm looking at the resumes what i see is they are putting everything they've achieved in the two years or past three years so that's not what the uh, hiring person or the organization wants so if you have a uh, uh, PMP certification and if the job is a transportation engineer who are looking for a highway designer if you're putting that like that may not make sense to the person hiring or uh, or to the even to the manager who is hiring because that's not what they're looking for so even if you have a small project of design experience put that first because that might actually draw their attention and always it's it's not how many things you have achieved it's what is relevant to the position that matters Always don't don't keep a target on how many applications you're putting, uh, how many you're sending. It's okay even if you send just one application in one month. That's fine. Put your energy and 100% of your dedication to that. Give your best. That's great. And then spend the energy on the networking. Spend the energy on CITE, right? Spend the energy in other ways. Uh, I think I agree with that. And um, yeah, and then learn. I, I know that most people don't get feedback from interview processes. Just in that closing, Bravia or Romain, did you get any time where someone actually told you you didn't get it and they gave you some advice? I'm really curious. Yeah, actually, for me, uh, it, it's not uh, via the. It's not the direct. Uh, they didn't uh, from the organization website. I didn't get the feedback, but when I reached out to that person in LinkedIn messaging and told, "Hey, I, I applied and I really had, uh, I really hoped I'd get it because I did everything I could. If you can just give me a feedback on this, that would be really helpful." They actually took time and they evaluated my resume and they they told me that there's nothing wrong from you. There is a person who is actually who can be more qualified and who can. Uh, you know, directly jump onto the job. You might need a bit of training because you're you're new to Canadian market. There might be a better candidate, but that that doesn't mean that uh, you're not qualified or you're not great. Don't take it to heart. That's how they gave the feedback to me, and they told keep moving. You'll get there. 
this is just the process enjoy the process they told and even uh, uh, there are people who you know like even the they can't refer me or they can't do anything they just used to ask my resume they just used to make those little marks like push this push this your education to the top column and the this this sentence shouldn't be this long who actually provided me the feedback like how to uh, customize my resume and how to edit it yeah that that really helped the feedback the uh, resume uh, editing tips all these that's really great. So congratulations, you two, Bavia with Jacobs in Vancouver, Romain with EXP, soon to be in Ottawa. Um, Bavia, maybe we'll get to meet uh, when at CIT Vancouver in uh, May. Uh, maybe Romain, he'll already be here in Ottawa. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, you want to get started? So uh, uh, that, this was great. Thank you, everybody, for um, being here today. and. Uh, this will be posted through the CITE website and then to the CITE YouTube page. Uh, Steve and I might do some updating as the last one was last August and we'll start deciding what we do next. But thank you everyone for being here today.